Good afternoon. My name is Chad Evans. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Council on Competitiveness. And I want to welcome everyone to our third Competing in the Next Economy webinar presented in partnership with Lockheed Martin. Our inaugural webinar took place this past May. It was the first in a series of conversations exploring key themes and findings from the Council's flagship initiative, the National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers. And that webinar focused on the future of sustainability. Our second webinar in June, we looked beyond digital manufacturing to understand the imperative of total transformation across the US manufacturing enterprise from companies small to large to our incredible array of universities and national laboratories, as well as the public sector. And today, our third and final competing in the next economy webinar for this year, we'll be looking at pushing back the frontiers of technology and defining the future of innovation. And we'll be focusing our council community, all of you, on the challenges that face us in developing and deploying technology-based innovation to scale, as well as looking at the potential competitiveness opportunities that could accrue if we get that right. I'm joined by an incredible panel. I'll introduce them now and turn to them soon. We have Stephen Walker, the Vice President and the Chief Technology Officer at Lockheed Martin, and one of the Council's National Commissioners. Ken Badil, the Laboratory Director at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Jamie Hindman, the Chief Technology Officer of Deere and Company, and the Chairman of the Council's CTO Initiative. Robert Johnson, the President of Western New England University, and also one of the Council's distinguished national commissioners. And we're joined by the council's president and CEO, Deborah Wynn Smith. Now, as we think about pushing back the frontiers of technology and defining the future of innovation in the third decade of the 21st century, what do we mean by that? Well, today, a tornado of technology is sweeping across the, and in some sense, reshaping the innovation landscape, transforming every domain of human existence. And over the coming decades, the evolving dimensions, disruptions, pace, and the impact of technological change are likely to increase and fundamentally reshape our civilization. The distance between technologies that are emerging and scaling today and tomorrow's realities, that's shrinking. We cannot predict how the world is going to look in the coming decades and how human existence might evolve, but we can explore the possibilities. This webinar will examine a few of the key themes raised in our national commission and do just that with a distinguished set of leaders who I'm going to ask to gaze into their crystal balls and explore questions on the economic competitiveness, the national security, and the socio-technical implications of massive technological change and revolutionary innovation. We're going to explore three big themes. The first, Powerful technologies are scaling. Our National Commission highlights just a few of these. For example, sensorization is spreading like wildfire across our natural, built, and personal environments, while the Internet of Things is creating the largest system in history, connecting things on the planes of Earth, sky, and space at a scale once unimaginable. The world is moving rapidly towards a state of hyperconnectivity with the potential to reach millions of connected devices per square kilometer and trillions of devices connected globally. These sensors, connected devices, are also disgorging an ever-mounting tsunami of data, driving the datafication and the quantification of human existence. At the same time, igniting the new cycles of discovery, development, and performance. Another set of scaling tech involves autonomous systems and robots. These systems are expanding rapidly and reaching new areas of application, providing new capabilities for national defense, extending into sectors ranging from healthcare to lawn care, and moving into areas like farming and personal transportation. And of course, we have artificial intelligence that has already crossed over from hype to reality, hitting the mainstream in applications ranging from the intelligent virtual assistants and chatbots we deal with as customers every day, to technologies that also feed the world one seed at a time, and to a range of algorithms that are ingesting data and returning to us contextualized knowledge, knowledge that we can use and amplify our own powers to predict. And of course, as we've experienced over the past year and a half, 
biotechnology has shifted into a new, higher gear as researchers and biomedical, industrial, and agricultural producers are embracing rapid, precise gene editing tools. And a new economy is scaling and emerging around synthetic biology and biomanufacturing. Our second big trend, convergence. Convergence is creating, in fact, a new innovation space. Innovations are arising at the osmosis between seemingly unrelated domains of science and technology. And it's that intersection of disciplines, whether it's nanomedicine, agroenergy biotech, ecological economics, or biocomputing that will be the future. Now, leveraging these opportunities created by convergence requires, first, unprecedented collaboration between industry, academia, our national labs, and other stakeholders. It requires new models of organization and the actual process of innovation. And it requires new human resources. Now, the third trend that we're going to explore is probably obvious when you think about the prior two. It's that simply more disruptive technologies are on the horizon and coming. Researchers and startups are pushing back aggressively the frontiers of technology and the potentially powerful technologies that are beginning to appear are really um, beyond exciting and, and our panelists will share some of their insights here. But as an example, general AI might be able to perform cognitive tasks in any domain, unleashing a new revolution, perhaps more profound than the one released with the printing press and the democratization of knowledge. It could lead to the scale up of scientific discovery and innovation to unimaginable heights. Quantum science could provide capabilities far beyond what is possible with the most advanced technologies available today. Quantum computers could solve previously unsolvable problems and perhaps be a game changer in fields as diverse as medicine, encryption, chemistry, communications. And materials by design could replace off the shelf materials with novel and functionality that has novel functionality that we haven't seen before, and perhaps give to the world unimaginable or unattainable properties. Now, Steve, I, I want to open up to our panel and, and hear from all of you. And I'd like to start with you. You know, with the trends in mind that I've just laid out, um, and as you examine the challenges and opportunities ahead of us, um, and I hope that you might be able to share with us from your purview at Lockheed Martin where you are privileged to engage in an incredible portfolio of rapidly emerging technologies, many of which are ripe for innovation in, in the marketplace. How do you see this rapid cycling of technology disruption having an impact on, yes, US competitiveness, but also our national security? Yeah, thanks, Chad. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with everyone here today about this topic. Um, it's uh, it's amazing just listening to you go down that list of technologies and the disruption that's actually happening in, as you say, the third decade here in the 21st century. Um, the interesting thing that I think, as I uh, listen to the list you described, is those technologies. You know, you know, 50, 60 years ago, a lot of the tech was only available to the defense sector, right? In fact, that's where a lot of it was created. And if you listen to the list you just described, most of that is actually commercial sector developed, I would say, developed at our universities, uh, some in the defense sector, but a lot of it out in the commercial world. And, and so the fact that it's, it's being developed at the universities at, in the commercial sector says it's available to all, right? And, and, and uh, you know, from a national, I'll speak to the national security piece, from a national security piece, uh, that can be a little scary, right? Because uh, I would say not all of our peer adversaries have the same Western ethical values that maybe we do. And, and um, to some extent, uh, they have been more successful at taking some of those technologies and turning them into application. Right and 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 faster, maybe I would say than than the U.S. So um, one of the things we're trying to do at Lockheed Martin is uh, understand how to deter uh, peer adversaries and some of the capabilities they're building by uh, getting a lot 
more adaptive, agile, and surprising, I would say, mm -hmm. in, in the capabilities uh, and that we're trying to develop for our DOD customer, defense customer. And uh, you described the Internet of Things, uh, which, which I think was, was very interesting because one of the ways we think we're, be, we're going to be more adaptive, agile, and surprising in our defense posture, our deterrent posture, is by creating a defense internet of things, right? And being able to connect platforms and systems that we don't generally connect today. And, and then have those systems uh, coordinate and, uh, and act as one. And so um, the technologies required to do that are many of the technologies you described, AI machine learning, is a key one um, to help humans make decisions faster. You've got you think about this big internet uh, internet uh, thing in the sky, internet connection of things in the sky, and and you know, how do you make decisions with all that data coming in uh, about what you're going to do next? And so AI and machine learning is key to helping make uh, help humans make decisions faster. You know, communications is another technology uh, that, that people sort of take for granted, but with 5G and soon 6G coming down the pike, uh, how does the defense sector take advantage of that commercial communications technology and turn it into a, uh, a network of networks to do that Internet of Things in the sky? So we at Lockheed Martin have uh, programs in all these areas that we're working with the defense uh, customer uh, to, um, to, to get ahead of the game here in, in many of these technologies. Now, we realize we got to work with the commercial sector to do it. And so I would say one of the ways we're, we're trying to develop these capabilities faster is by working with U.S. commercial companies. And, and you know, as well as I do, that some of our peer adversaries, uh, you know, kind of blur the lines between commercial and defense. I'm not suggesting we do that in the U.S., but I'm suggesting that the defense sector take advantage of what's happening in the commercial world and build those partnerships you talked about, Chad, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, bring the, I call it the bleeding edge tech from commercial into defense and uh, allow us to build those capabilities I talked about that will make us more adaptive, agile, and surprising to our peer adversary. And it's not to go to war, it's to deter war uh, and to to to, uh, to counter uh, many of the capabilities they're putting out there that, that can defeat our current systems today. I'll stop there. But there's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, there is a lot to unpack and, and let's start to do that. And, and Kim, you know, maybe I could actually ask you to jump in here and, you know, and similarly provide some of your perspective and thoughts. Um, yes, from your position at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, but you also have an incredible background. Um, um, and our, from our university community, how do you think about this rapid cycling and um, and the implications of technological disruption on our security and competitiveness? And and I, I really love Steve's um, adaptive, agile, and surprising mantra. That's an interesting way to also actually think about competitiveness in the twenty first century. But Kim, would love to to hear your thoughts. Sir, sure, thanks very much. And and I agree. Steve raised some really interesting questions for us. Um, I think. For us in the National Lab environment, we sit at a really nice nexus of the communities that he described. We work very closely with the academic community, uh, drawing on the fruits of fundamental research, participating in the international science and technology community, understanding trends, uh, but also working with industry and really trying to bring technologies um, out of that ecosystem into um, application space. But there are two things that I think are really important today uh, that have changed very rapidly. One is this uh, theme around democratization or lowering mm -hmm. the barriers to access. There was a time where strategic technologies could be protected because only state actors or large government programs could get access to those types of technologies. And certainly in information technology and biotechnology, even access to space, you know, that's no longer the case. So the national security space is incredibly complex. And the second one is speed. You know, the um, government innovation ecosystem wasn't built for speed. It was built for long-term commitment to big challenges. And so we're going through a transition right now where we're learning how to keep that long-term perspective, but develop the kind of rapid innovation cycle that you see in the private sector. 
because that really is our strategic advantage. Um, you know, if you think about the technology uh, areas we've been discussing in, you know, communications and Internet of Things, et cetera, the difference between civilian technologies and benign applications and military and defense applications is very hard to discern. So, you know, cyber capabilities are ubiquitous. It's amazing what we'll be able to do with you know, collaborative autonomy and the defense internet of things, but that also means we're more dependent on cyber capabilities, space capabilities, those technologies than we were in the past. So thinking about not just the benefits they accrue to us, but understanding what kind of vulnerabilities they may present to us as well, I think is important uh, in this environment. So I see you know, enormous opportunity, uh, but for us really thinking about both the, the positive benefits of technologies, I'll use AI as an example for us, we're spending a lot of effort on machine learning and AI technologies, um, but how do you assure your systems when they're built on um, artificial intelligence engines? How do you uh, protect your cyber assets when you know that barriers are not an option in that environment? How do you assure uninterrupted access to key nodes in your communication network uh, in this very complex environment? So um, I think it's a really interesting time and it's presenting a really great, from my perspective, uh, challenge to the traditional um, defense innovation ecosystem to, to really step up and, and generate that pace that I think will be our strategic advantage. Kim, I, 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 this, your reflections on the points that Steve made around speed and agility, but also introducing this idea, of the democratization of the innovation process, both for the positives that that implies that you know, a young woman in a garage today can create a new business without perhaps the traditional tools of innovation that, you know, that we might have thought of even just five, 10 or 15 years ago. But then the flip side, you know, the, the challenges that that, democrat, that global democratization, the fungibility of research and innovation capacity, what that might mean for security. I'm wondering, and I'll ask Steve, you and Kim first, but then I'm gonna open it up to Jamie and Robert and Deborah for their comments on this as well. What do you see as the most critical national security issue in this, this rapid churn of technology and innovation? Um, what, what perhaps keeps you up at night and maybe it's a concern, but also maybe where you see it as an opportunity that if we, if we get it right, it, it might uh, pretend a greater competitive advantage for the U.S. Um, for me, uh, what, what I find both an opportunity and a, an enormous challenge for us is this uh, nexus of technologies. You talked about convergence and bringing together different disciplines. Uh, in security space, the same thing is operative. It's not just should I worry about you know conventional conflict or cyber conflict or you know what's happening in space. You need to be able to think about that whole ecosystem as an ecosystem. You know how do these different domains interact with each other, and how do we think about creating asymmetric advantage because mm -hmm. of the immense technological capabilities that we have. You know I like the the image that Steve brought of you know bringing surprise to the battlefield. Yeah. You know not not waiting to understand what others are doing, but really creating um, advantages for ourselves uh, through unique uses of technology. Yeah, I love that, that concept of surprise, not just in the battle, but surprise in the marketplace, you know, just written large, how do we, I, I think we might've called it differentiation in the past, but I like this, um, this, this thought. Steve, did you wanna um, weigh in? And then I'm gonna open it up to Jamie and Robert and Deborah as well. Just a short, you know, if I had to pick a technology that keeps me up at night and I laughed because I used to, and I, I still believe it, but when I was the director of DARPA, I would say bi biology keeps me up at night, right? And it, you know, literally did. But um, the, uh, the biotech piece is really interesting. It was very interesting to DARPA. We started the biological technologies office back in 2014. Mm -hmm. We played a big role that DARPA played a big role uh, with the NIH in producing these mRNA vaccines that we now see in use, thank God. Um, but, you know, much like uh, Kim mentioned on AI and machine learning, it can be turned, turned into a bad thing too, right? So I, you know, and that's true about just about any technology, right? But the, the biotech piece is just such a powerful technology that that in you know COVID nineteen we we got to get our arms around as a as a as a world 
you know, how to how to look at this stuff and and, and protect our populations against it. So that would be that would, if I had to pick one technology, that's what keeps me up at night. Well, Jamie, Robert, Deborah, I, I don't know who wants to go first, but I'd love to get your reactions to what you've heard from Steve and Kim around these concepts of speed, agility, surprise, democratization, the linkage between national security, competitiveness, and the technology driver. What what um, what are your reactions, thoughts, concerns? And then Jamie, I'm going to come to you for an, another question after that. I I have um, um, it's a balance, right, between national security and the democratization of these new technologies in a global environment. Um, you know, we by what twenty what forty or so, we will have um, you know close to ten billion people on this planet. And if we don't find a way that as we democratize technology so that people can have balance from an income inequality perspective, we then create an environment where you will have more people trying to do bad things with good technology with all of these new disruptions. So I think one of the challenges for us as we think of ourselves as a global society mm -hmm. is how do we find that balance? How do we bring agility into the socioeconomic um, 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 uh, environment throughout the globe? How do we uh, enable and empower people uh, to uh, create jobs for themselves as a status quo? You know, my son and daughter who are 26 and 28 will have 17 different jobs in five different industries and three of those industries don't exist. Now multiply that across the globe. Uh, and if people don't understand how to create value for themselves, um, then they're going to do whatever they need to do in order to survive. And sometimes that can lead to people doing very bad things solely for survival and being manipulated to do so. Jamie or Deborah, either one of you want to hop in and follow up? Maybe I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by a couple things that, that um, both both Kim and Steve have mentioned. The, the first is this focus on agility uh, and the need to be agile uh, moving forward because the technology is changing so quickly. Uh, and it strikes me that the, you know, the organizations, uh, some of which are represented here on the phone, one of which I represent, are uh, large organizations where agility comes difficult and be, becomes very difficult because of the organizational structure, because of the size of the organization, et cetera, and so on. And I think that raises an important opportunity that Steve mentioned uh, you know, the partnership with um, entities outside of our organizations to partner with them to, to, to seed that capability to become more agile uh, with the, the commercialization of technology, for example, or the development of the technology uh, to begin with, I think is really important to try to offset all of the, the, the benefits that come with large organizations that go about executing and delivering with smaller organizations, perhaps, that are fundamentally more nimble and, and agile uh, in terms of development and deployment of the technology. I think the two of those are, are important to have and they, they can exist together and I think they're better together, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Deborah, any thoughts? Yes, just building on what my colleagues have said, I think one of the issues that's really critical if you look at this whole um, transformation and the themes of, of scaling, of convergence, of nonstop disruption is that our business processes and our governance models are still for the most part, very static, very risk averse, linear, and they don't collaborate. And so dealing with both the national security issues and challenges as well as economic competitiveness really means we have to apply in as best we can in our government, in our partnerships, some of these same uh, transformations that are occurring in technology. So two areas, of course, that are critical for U.S. leadership. How are we going to lead and respond in the regulatory arena for this whole new suite of technologies that are transforming the world? How are we going to lead or not lead in the standard setting? Uh, we see other parts of the world, um, the EU, for example, taking a very aggressive uh, position on many regulatory standards issues in, in the digital world, uh, certainly on antitrust policy, um, very antithetical actually to U.S. interests in those two fronts. 
And then similarly, uh, you know, non-friendly nations being very, very aggressive in populating standard bodies, as well as, you know, to think of China leading the uh, intellectual property, global intellectual property organization is, is pretty uh, shocking. So I think that, and I know we're going to talk about this, where we are in the U.S. government, in our policy, in our partnerships between government, the private sector, industry, national labs, and universities, we have to also begin to think of absolutely new disruptive models and collaborating across traditional silos. And then I hope, Chad, as we get into the discussion, let's talk a little bit about how we should collaborate in the global arena where this concept that Steve's brought in of surprise is very significant. And this new you know, strategic agreement um, and relationship between Australia, the US and the UK is an example of a surprise. Deborah, absolutely. We, we are gonna come back to those issues. Um, so you, you, thank you for foreshadowing and, and setting that stage. Before we get there, I'd like to ask all of you, and, and Jamie, I'm gonna start with you first though, to think and help uh, our, our audience think more deeply about um, as we traverse this sort of cycle of tech-driven innovation, creative destruction, we see the reorganization of our society, our economies, our labor markets. I mean, in that context, what do you see as the industries that are perhaps most likely to face, I would say the most major technological disruption in the years ahead and why? That's a great question, Chad. And I think the list would actually be shorter if you asked the inverse question, frankly. Yeah. I think that's that's uh, the magnitude of what we're talking about. You know, whether you look at what alternative energy is going to do in the automotive sector, uh, you look at what I, I would call digital travel, which I think is what we're doing now and, and how that's shaping and changing uh, You know, aviation as we know it, uh, the services industries that are being uh, you know, augmented by uh, virtual reality by artificial intelligence, et cetera, and so on. I think the the scope of what we're talking about is is frankly enormous, and I think there will not be an industry that isn't touched by technology in some way. But maybe I'll dig deeper on on one that I'm intimately familiar with, Chad, and then uh, maybe provide some some uh, food for thought for how that mental model uh, might be uh, extrapolated to other uh, parts of of, uh, of industry. Uh, and so the one that I'm going to reference is agriculture, uh, uh, working for deer, it, it's near and dear to my heart. And if we think about these technologies uh, and how they've impacted agriculture, uh, whether that's, you know, autonomy and higher levels of automation, helping to augment and offset uh, what is, uh, you know, a labor shortage, I would argue universally. Uh, if you look at the, the latest uh, census report uh, from the U.S., uh, you'll notice again, you know, a shift from rural to urban. Uh, fundamentally, that's a challenge for the folks that operate the equipment uh, on my desk behind me uh, to get the job done every day that they have to do in order to, to provide food for, uh, as Robert already mentioned, a, a growing world population. Um, but in addition to that, the technology that's being deployed on farms today in and around this idea of precision ag is the, the notion that we can take what was once an intractable problem. Uh, imagine, you know, 200 million acres of corn ground uh, in, in the United States alone at 40,000 plants per acre. Uh, and, and that was typically treated all the same way by a farmer. They applied the same practices across every acre of that ground. Uh, they applied the same rate of seeding. They applied the same fertilization, you know, the same herbicides, the same inputs, uh, and harvested it all in the same way, uh, and maybe made changes uh, recently, you know, the last 20, 30 years in the genetic variety of crops that they planted. But generally, the crops were all treated the same. Uniformity was required because of the scale at which the operation uh, was, was uh, because of the scale of the operation and the magnitude uh, of, of the, the operation. And today, we're at a point where we can start to consider and think about uh, you know, treating every one of those corn plants, you know, every four, all 40,000 of them per acre as an individual plant. And what does that plant need individually to maximize its potential? Um, what does it need in terms of nutrients? What does it need, need in terms of crop care? Uh, and what does it need because it's dependent upon its neighbor for sunlight and all sorts of different things? It's in competition. 
uh, with its neighbors? How do we maximize the individual contribution of each and every corn plant? And you think about that just in terms of scale, it's tremendous, right? It's 40,000 plants per acre, 200 million acres just in one crop type. But we're rapidly approaching a point where the technologies that we've all talked about today, whether it's you know machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, you know connectivity that's nearly ubiquitous, and at latencies and bandwidths that make it make it tractable, uh, large data set manipulations, cloud computing, et cetera, and so on. All of those things have sort of come together in the modern time to make that problem possible, right? And so that's this idea of being able to execute precision at scale. And I think if you take that idea and you extrapolate it, I'll give you uh, an example. Uh, and it's, it's pertinent maybe for some of the folks on this call in education, higher education. What if we had the capability of, of applying precision at scale for each individual student, right? Mm -hmm. How, if we could maximize the potential of each individual student and cater to their needs, how they learn, when they need to learn, what they need to learn. Uh, you know, I think the opportunity in that space is pretty tremendous because it, it fully optimizes the individual problem and it does it at scale. And we're getting to the point where that is, uh, that is a solution that we can entertain. It's possible for us to do it. And I think that future is really, really exciting. Jamie, before I let you go, and before I open up to the, your fellow panelists with some of these provocative um, remarks, um, you know, you just brought to life for us the concept that Steve kicked us off with, agility. You couple to that precision at scale, and you highlighted just a little bit. I, mean, I wonder if you just go a little bit deeper on what kind of infrastructure underpins that ability to be more agile, to be more precise at scale? You now you hinted at AI and some other um, technologies, but I'm wondering as you think um, from your seat um, at Deere, what matters most to you in your future? What sort of infrastructure investments are going to be needed to enable you to be even more agile, more precise? Yeah, I think a foundational element, Chad, is connectivity. You know, if you can't connect the entities that you need to be able to measure from and get that information to a point of usefulness for whoever is, is deriving value from it, uh, the whole thing falls apart, right? So this, this uh, uh, connectivity problem is the one that, that is the foundation, in, in my view, for this precision at scale idea. Uh, and I think it applies more than just to the agricultural use case. It's it's more difficult perhaps in agriculture because of the rural environment that we operate in. But nevertheless, if you extrapolate it out into other use cases, you fundamentally come back to this need to, to, to acquire the information to be able to operate precision at scale. And that, that fundamental building block is connectivity in one way, shape, or form. Steve, Kim, Robert, Deborah, I'd love for any reactions you had to to, to Jamie's points, either in terms of the ability to be more agile and precise at scale, um, either from the perspective of a technology, but I would also like to transition on the latter point he made around um, education at scale. Mm -hmm. and, and Robert, so I'm sort of teeing you up there a little bit, but sure. I think it's, it, it implies more than even just at our universities. And I'd be interested in Kim and Steve and ever your thoughts on, you know, how do we scale ongoing lifelong education training within your own organizations. But, but Robert, I've teed you up, so why don't you go sure. first? Sure, I, I, as, I, as I think about this, um, as I was listening to Jeremy, what we're really talking about, or Jamie, what we're really talking about is, is personalization. You know, how do we, how do we, we scale everything up uh, so that it can be um, personalized in terms of the experience, the student experience, the consumer experience, and, and I shouldn't say consumer experience, I should say prosumer experience, right? The consumer experience is you build a product and people will buy it. The prosumer experience is the, um, the, the consumer says, this is what I want, and the manufacturer produces it exactly the way that you want it. Because I think in terms of, of, of education, uh, what we really have to do um, you know, from a university perspective, and I think also from a K-12 perspective, is, is we have to create, you know, what I think of as new traditional universities, new traditional universities that provide uh, an agile mind education that teaches our young people how to learn, unlearn, and relearn at a steady state, and to have the mindset to continuously create value in all that they do. So my job, my role as a university president is to teach our people to learn, unlearn, and relearn and say, we're gonna help you get that first job, but every job thereafter, 
you're going to have to create, even if you're working for John Deere for the next 20 years and you move in and out of five, six, seven different uh, positions, you're going to have to be in this constant state of reinventing yourself. And if we do that, then we will have an agile workforce with an agile mindset that can capitalize on this personalization as things have been brought up to scale and add value to the companies. You know, Steve was talking earlier uh, about, you know, having that surprise moment. But think about if all of our employees uh, were always thinking about, you know, how can I create that next thing that will eliminate my job to make our company or our, our organization more efficient or better? Well, our educational model has to be like that as well. Let's face it, our K-12 system was created for an agrarian economy. Uh, I think that we have to totally deconstruct it and um, you know, take it to another level and say, what if we were building our, our, our system from the ground up, what might that look like? But I think for colleges and universities, if we begin to go down this road uh, of, of becoming new traditional universities with agile mind educations that teaches people how to learn, unlearn, and relearn, to continuously create value, that's what's going to prepare the workforce to come into your organizations and be relevant, not just for now, but forever. Stackable credentials is not about a do. Why do we even ask people, and I know there are some people from higher education, but why do we ask people, what is your degree in? You know, what did you major in? Only about 27% of the people uh, who are working, who have a college degree, are working within their discipline. What do you do? Well, what I did yesterday is going to be different from what I do tomorrow because I have an agile mindset and I'm constantly thinking about how to learn, unlearn, and relearn uh, so that I can create value in all that I do. Steve, Kim, Deborah, any reactions to Robert's um, even more provocative thinking around personalization of the experience and what that might pretend for our own innovation engine in the United States? I'll just jump in with a few comments and, and, and hope yeah. others will add to it that you know, this concept that, that we're talking about in terms of competitiveness and ensuring prosperity and security of our nation, it really is about learning, differential rates of learning, but also the ability to have the critical thinking and the judgment that ultimately creates value that's acceptable in society. And so I think we also need to add into the equation how do we build in, and maybe this is something that, that is too optimistic for the future, but how do we build in the foundations of trust and sort of universal ethics that are going to either propel us forward or at some point be very big barriers? Because everything we're talking about, and I think Steve made this comment early on, and our, our, our colleagues in Japan, some of us just finished with the Japan Science and Technology Forum. We talk about the the lights and shadows of technology, but trust and ethics and, and, and the ability to move forward and do complex things that have questionable outcomes that take a lot of risk require some of those foundations that um, make us humans and make us you know, move forward to create a better world for humankind. So I wanna throw that out onto the, the table as well. If I could jump in, I couldn't agree more, Deborah and you know, Robert with your comments on education. You know, as technology disrupts our society more and more and accelerates at a faster pace, we got to have an ethical population that, that uses it in the right way. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's so important. And, uh, you know, I don't know that our K through 12 educational system is set up right now uh, in a great way to, to be prepared for this future that we're facing. Um, the other thing I'll say is, um, as I listen to uh, Jamie's comments and Robert's comments, uh, really agree with them. But wh where my head goes uh, in terms of personalization, which I think is an interesting term, in, in terms of how you scale that, you know, when we when we when we think about you know controlling something in DoD land, it's you got to have that pervasive sensing, right? Twenty four seven sensing, right? And to do the personalization part, we're going to be talking about privacy, right? Issues, and, and how to how to understand a person well enough to to provide them with that personal personal information, personal touch. That's tricky, right? In in many ways, and so that's 
kind of a challenge, I would say, or an opportunity and how to, how to do that ethically. Uh, I think it can be done, but again, uh, think about some of our peer adversaries. They're probably not doing it in the way we would want it done. Uh, and, you know, trying to personalize uh, their population uh, to do different things. And so um, just, just an, an issue I wanted to raise and throw out there. Well, Steve, can't you come up with a chip that we can download into everyone that will give us all a sense of humanity? I used to get, well, no, no. I thought you were going somewhere else, but yeah. Um, I used to get calls at DARPA all the time about people complaining I was doing that already. Um, but we didn't, uh, no, I, I, that's a, you know, <laughs> we laugh, Robert, but you know, gosh. I, I was I was saying we're that that's, that's where technology can go, right? Uh, because it goes back to Deborah's point of, 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 of ethics. You know, I think ethics um, in you know civility, humanity, all of those things uh, should be taught in the schools. It should be taught, taught at all of our colleges and universities. Um, we got to have something common that we rally around that exactly. give us a sense of purpose and direction in all that we do. And I think that we have we have lost our way in that regard. There's really only one set of facts and we need to understand and, and be able to have civil discourse about that. I think that's an incredibly important point, uh, developing a set of cultural values and norms uh, that we can rally around. Um, you know, the technology exists to do a lot of these things. Technology is not the problem, right? you need to understand how to make these technologies uh, useful, impactful in a positive way for people's lives. I think education is a good example. Uh, we just spent a year where we sent a lot of our youth home uh, to do their educations virtually. And it really created huge disparities in outcomes because it's not simply about delivering content, it's about connecting with people. And so the technology has inherent limitations to it. Uh, and this question about, you know, building a culture of career long learning, which is something we're spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, National Lab is sort of a microcosm of the environment you're describing. We're built around team science. So I don't have, you know, stovepipes of physicists and chemists and biologists and engineers. The goal is to bring people who have intellectual capacity together to think about hard problems. And at the end of the day, I can't tell you which one is which, because everyone is contributing ideas and uh, you know, new thoughts on the topic at hand. So uh, trying to make sure we don't leave behind the human factor in this conversation is incredibly important. And it is, you know, cultural values and norms, but it's also understanding how to connect the, uh, this amazing capacity we have in technology space to real live human beings in a way that'll be beneficial. Well, Kim, I would love to, uh, for the group to follow up on that, and maybe Robert, I'll turn to you first. You know, as we think about this range of disruptive technologies that we kicked off this conversation describing AI, autonomy, extended reality, you know, what is this really going to mean for people and for their role in the workforce in our society? Because I think we know there are likely to be very significant disruptions, dislocations, We've seen them at every other major transition point in the history of, of um, our economic history. Um, so how do we actually educate and mitigate against the downsides of some of the rapid technological change that we are undergoing and will continue to undergo? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a great question and the impact is going to be enormous. Uh, I think it was the World Economic Forum uh, in earlier this year in January, February, came out with a report that said there would be just shy of 100 million new jobs created as a result of AI and other disruptive technologies between now and 2025. Think about that. Um, and then uh, a different report came out by McKinsey that said uh, recently that, that said 40% of our current workforce in a global society are, um, are uh, location agnostics. <laughs> Okay, they don't care where they live. So when we start thinking about a competition for talent, if we don't have the uh, sociological pieces in place and the economic pieces in place 
within our own country, because it, it really will be country against country, geographical uh, competition for, for, for labor, we're gonna find ourselves in a very, very precarious situation. How do we mitigate it? I wanna come back first to a point that, 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 that Kim makes. I think we have to give um, um, the, the technology is merely a tool. If people do not have the values um, and um, the right thinking as it centers around how to use the tool, it doesn't matter if it's a baseball bat, a gun, a cannon, or the internet, damage can and will be done. So we got to start young with our young kids. We got to totally disrupt our, our, our K through 12 system. We have to turn it over upside down on its head. And I, I think that as an ecosystem, we have to look at ourselves within education, within higher education, um, in terms of stackable credentials, but not just uh, giving individuals credentials and degrees, but giving them a mindset to understand that they're gonna be disruptors and innovators their entire lives. They're gonna be value creators their entire lives. So, um, you know, Simply because you get a degree, it used to be, you know, you graduate from school and you get a promotion in three to five, five to seven years, and you go up that ladder, you might change a company or two, 30, 40 years later, you know, you're retiring. That is no more. Um, the world is very, very different. So even if I educate one of my alums to with a cyber security certificate, I have to help them understand that's only going to be re relevant for three, four, five years. And you're going to be right back into this mix of, of lifelong learning. So I think we have to begin to build within our ethos, within our um, uh, sociological and economic systems to help people understand that this is a way of life. Look, I grew up in Detroit, and it used to be you get a job in the factory and you had a job for life, you retire and go off into the sunset. One of the reasons why we have so much disruption in our economy uh, socially right now is nobody explained to them that... Um, the jobs of the past of making $30, $40, $50 an hour, if that started back in the 80s in terms of that disruption, and we're now seeing it now, and they don't have the mindset that I need to do something different. So I think that we have to begin to not just get it, look, getting the credential, getting the, the skill set, um, you know, earning the degree or the certificate, that's the easy part. We have to think about ourselves as global citizens, as a community of learners, and I'll come back to this, as we are creating these new traditional universities that have an agile mindset, uh, uh, that provide an agile mind education that teaches people to learn, unlearn, and relearn, and to give them uniquely human skills that cannot be replicated by a robot. And then, and then if we're in the, in the right mindset to continuously create value, then if they're working for Jamie, or Steve, or if they're at the National Lab, or they have a nonprofit, guess what? We'll have all of, we'll have hundreds of thousands and millions of garages where entrepreneurship and innovation is taking place and personalization beyond uh, our wildest imagination. Uh, but I, I think this piece about people is really important. And I guess I'll close um, with coming back again to Kim, as I think about the disruption that has taken place with, 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 with COVID and particularly how women have been impacted in terms of dropping out of, of the workforce. And we can talk about disruptive technologies and 100 million new jobs in five years and all of those kinds of things. But fundamentally, if we don't figure out how to change our organization to meet the needs of our employees, um, and while technology is important, and this disruptive technology is important, I think we have to start with families then technology. And then if we start with families and then technology and create our ecosystems within our organizations to be supportive and to perpetuate the quality of life that our employees want, want desire, um, then they'll be less inclined to be uh, location agnostic in terms of where they work. They'll want to work at our companies, at our organization. So I think that that's, that's got to be part of it. But we have to start in pre-K. We can't wait until they get to us, you know, within the colleges and universities. So, you know, if we're going to mitigate it, it's got to be social, it's got to be economic, uh, but most importantly, we have to think of these new traditional universities that will have an agile mind education that will teach people to learn and unlearn and relearn 
and continuously create value with a mindset that they have uniquely or essential human skills that can't be replicated by robots. I'll get off of my soapbox. <laughs> no, stay on the soapbox, Robert. Um, uh, but but you, you raised a, a lot of points. I'm gonna turn to everyone, but maybe I'll tee up one or two thoughts then get others' reactions. You, you mentioned at almost the very beginning, Robert, this idea that there is really now global fungibility, a global talent pool. Um, people wanna live and work wherever they can. Um, and I, I'm curious at perhaps if there are different ways that some people like Stephen Kim might be thinking about that as opposed to, say, Jamie in a more um, commercially oriented company. Whereas, Kevin, Steve, I don't want to presume, but in your environments where national security and the types of people you can attract and employ, it might be a little different. So I, I just would love your reactions. And of course, Deborah, um, given your experience, I uh, would also uh, value your input there. But um, Steve or Kim, I don't know if you want to kick off first. Sure. So it is a little bit different for us uh, in both dimensions. You mentioned, you know, the international character to science and technology. We obviously want to interact with uh, the best people, the best ideas from around the world and bring them here to our ecosystem. The core of our work is national security focused. So again, that's focused on U.S. citizens in particular. People can get clearances. We do classified research. Uh, we also do a lot of hard technology development. So the second part, this transition to uh, people's expectations around a hybrid work environment or a remote work environment is something we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, there are elements of our culture, of our innovation ecosystem uh, that have really been built around interactions, uh, people working together, mixing people who do, for example, computational work with people who do experimental science or build things. Uh, and so I don't want to lose all the attributes, uh, good things about that type of uh, mix between people in different cultures, um, but but also I, you know, we're in California. It's a very expensive place to live. Uh, quality of life is very dependent on cost of living, and so giving people additional flexibility to balance their lives and their work. I agree uh, with what Robert was talking about. You know, we have to think about people's lives. I want them to be deeply passionate about their work but they're entitled to have a life outside of their work as well and, and giving them an environment that allows them to balance those two things, uh, to have adequate supports, to have a family, to um, own a home, to you know, have a good life outside of their work environment is critically important to getting them to invest in being a part of our uh, innovation ecosystem here at the laboratory. I'll just add to what Kim said. I mean, we have similar environments, but Lockheed Martin, <laughs> Is a pretty virtual company these days, so we we got people all over the all over the world, and you know, thanks to the internet, we've been able to communicate and keep moving forward. We obviously have production facilities and classified environments and labs where you've got to be there physically, but uh, we're we're doing a lot virtually these days, and we'll continue to because, as, as somebody said, maybe Robert, that you know, people are you know people are finding that they they're pretty agnostic as to where they work from. Uh, and so, uh, and, and some people though are, you know, want to work from a certain place. And so we're being very flexible these days uh, because it's a competition. They'll go to a different company if we're not. Yeah. Jamie, I agree. I don't, I'm sorry. I do yeah. want to agree with that last point. We have put a lot of time and thought into how to be more flexible. And I would say uh, we demonstrated a level of flexibility in the last 18 months that few people here thought was possible, and we are definitely capturing that and keeping it for the future. Awesome. Jamie or Deborah? Uh, I, oh, I, I'm just add one comment here that all of us that are on this great discussion today have had careers where we've been mentored, where we have learned from our peers, at different, our peers, our superiors, whatever you want to call them, as we've built our, our careers and our capabilities. And I am very concerned that the young people that are entering, you know, this this new world that's before us, right now, are not having these opportunities to build the the intangible social skills, the relationships that we carry forward and we integrate throughout our lives, no matter how many jobs, how many places we're going to be. And so that gets back to this human issue. You know, humans are we like to be together, and I think we're even enjoying being together right now virtually. So. 
place-based innovation is very important, but also um, how are we going to ensure that all of us that are really in mentoring stage of life give these um, intangible human skills, social skills, um, relationship skills to the next generation of, of young people that are going to build our, our future worlds. Jamie, any thoughts for you? Yeah, I just, I just throw in, you know, the way, the way that, um, you know, I think it's impacted deer is that we've seen the, the, the competition for talent go from a local competition or a pseudo local competition to a global competition, right? We now are, uh, have the ability to secure talent from anywhere uh, across the globe because many positions can be done uh, virtually. And that's, uh, that's a blessing and a curse. It, it fundamentally is, I think, reduced the inertia that employees have to get over to number one, leave the company, uh, but number two, to, to go to a different company. And so we, we've seen you know, both ends of that uh, to the point that, that Kim and Deborah have already made. You know, I think the price we pay for that uh, ability to secure talent globally is a, a steeper challenge to build culture. Uh, it's, it's just harder to do virtually. Uh, there's no replacement for in-person, in-the-office uh, conversations and relationship building. Uh, and so that cultural identity uh, building uh, takes more intentionality. And frankly, if you don't do it well, uh, you know, it, it results in less stickiness of those employees within your organization. Uh, they, they, they find their way somewhere else in the future. So it is a, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, I guess, is the summary. Folks, we've got about five or six minutes left. So I'm going to pivot to a final question. I'm going to, Deborah, I'm going to ask you to perhaps lead off this, but I will ask everyone else to follow up. And I'm starting with you, Deborah, because you foreshadowed this. You teed it up in a, one of your earlier comments. You talked earlier about the need for the, us to all to innovate our business models or innovating governance models. But what about our policymaking model? Deborah, what's your perception you lead our National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness Frontiers with our board and tremendous group of now hundreds of stakeholders across the country who've developed some really, I think, important recommendations for our policymakers to, in some sense, uh, improve tenfold our ability to innovate. But do you think our national leaders and our policymakers are paying enough attention to the profound implications of everything that we've all just been talking about? And if not, maybe why not? And what, what can we do about that? Chad, I, I, I think, and for some of us who've served in government, and government, of course, plays a very important role in the policy making and policy setting in the federal, but also the legislative branch, you know, to, to shape this environment that unleashes our innovation capacity, our potential to, to create value as a nation, both economically and national security. And the two, of course, are intertwined. And really, we have very outdated models of how we work and collaborate, certainly in the federal government. I mean, you could even, I think Kim can talk about this, the Department of Energy, you know, has this tremendous uh, asset of the national labs. And over the years, they've done a great job of beginning to collaborate and, and pull together their resources. But for instance, making any set of policies, whether it's tax policy, antitrust, you can name them all, how do we integrate the different components of this around convergence and scaling the same way we're talking about technology? And it is still really done in outmoded stovepipe. So one of the things that I think, you know, very powerful about the model and, and, and success and, and, and business of what the Council on Competitiveness is about is that we are ultimately a systems integrator. We are looking at a whole set of issues and challenges that shape our productivity and prosperity, knowing there's not a silver bullet and we have to go deep in various dimensions, whether it's you know, looking at, again, a, a tax issue, an investment in R&D, people skills, but then how do you integrate these across in order to come up with a scalable solution and action? And we need to do a much better job of that at our federal government and certainly for our states to work together as well, you know, to have a, a, a product liability set of regulations that are different across all our states when we're competing globally. So uh, I, I would say that on the policy making front, we've got a lot to do to really uh, be in any way in tandem with what's going on in the great technology revolutions, scaling, convergence, and, and disrupt in how we make policy. And that's certainly 
what we're, we're trying to do, and I think have made some great progress in the National Commission on Innovation and Competitiveness, because it's all about, yes, developing the knowledge and understanding, but then being a systems integrator of what do we need to do and move forward in our country. Robert, Kim, Jamie, Steve, any final thoughts or reflections on that question and what you heard from Deborah? So uh, definitely agree with Deborah's observations. I'll just note, you know, in science, all the interesting things happen at intersections and boundaries. Uh, government is all intersections and boundaries. It's also where friction arises. Um, the speed and agility of our policymaking process really does need to change fundamentally how we think about business process, building partnerships um, has to change in very fundamental ways, not 10% at the margin, but really be rethought in light of the type of pace we're trying to keep up with here. And I agree, it's economic competitiveness, national security competitiveness, competitiveness for talent. Um, you know, in every sector, we're, we're trapped in a business model that was created for a different world. And we really need to get serious about that. Gentlemen, anyone want to dive in there before we close up? I'll just say, I, think, I thought Lockheed Martin had a hard system integration job, but Deborah, I think the Council of Competitiveness has a harder job. <laughs> Deborah, we're counting on you. <laughs> Great. Well, folks, um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Council on Competitiveness. It's been a great conversation, a great panel. I also want to thank again, Steve, you, the Lockheed Martin team for your partnership and supporting this series uh, over the past few months. It's been a great experience for the council and our, our overall community. I wanna thank our participants and our audience for joining us today. And I'll close with just a final note. We hope you all will be on the lookout for information soon regarding our 2021 National Competitiveness Forum that will take place virtually on December 16th, 2021. We'll hear more from Deborah and the council team on that front. But again, panel, thank you so much. Um, look forward to working with you going forward. Have a great afternoon, everyone.